Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the fourth episode of the Scale Podcast. Today, I have Nathan as the guest of our show, who is from Skewed, and who just actually hosted the ARC Intensive uh, online webinar for Archicad, where I also did a session on Landscape. How are you doing, Nathan? Going really well, mate. Going really well for uh, sitting here in the different time zones that we face and, and the early evening. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you for joining the podcast. And I uh, just mentioned that we just... So, Arc Intensive, I guess, was an idea. And I ran my first event back in 2020. And it was kind of right on the edge of COVID to the point where I had a couple of presenters that were supposed to fly in from Hong Kong and actually present. And basically, the advice I had at the time was, is, you know, don't fly them in because the borders to Australia could shut and they might be stuck here. So trying to build on the efforts of what I put together in 2020 in 2021, I then put together an event and I was thinking, well, how can we create an event that isn't kind of biased to a certain time zone or set up so that only certain people from around the world can watch it. So the idea was create a global event that runs for 24 hours straight, which means that everyone can gather together as a community across the globe and make the event free to attend so that by being free to attend it wasn't limiting people's capabilities of actually attending the, you know the limiting factor being that they need to be able to um, have access to the internet to be able to attend and watch the event mm -hmm. perfect um and how how has it transitioned and how has it grown and just how has the format changed from 2020 to the last event that you did well, the first one in 2020 was a traditional face-to-face -face conference. So it was run over two days and we had, you know, 12 sessions over two days um, and, and the normal networking that takes place. And for me, whenever I go to a conference, there's two pieces to a conference that I always look and see as critical pieces of the puzzle. First of all, there's the technical learning, but then second to that technical learning is that ability to network and communicate with people. Moving to the online, it's been it's been a bit challenging because you cannot re it, the networking is very difficult you know you're trying to communicate via chat um the event we ran online in 2021 um i still will to this day say it's the largest archicad user event ever held um we had uh, 740 people log in over the 24 hours to watch the event um the event this year um we had just under 700, I think it was 696 people that logged in. Now, because COVID has moved on and, and the world is starting to move on, I think it was just last week where well, the World Health Organization, I think, took it off the list of being a, a critical thing of some sorts. Um, I think people are more interested once again in those face-to-face -face events. So I think moving forward uh, into 2024, the format and structure might change for Arc Intensive in terms of trying to trying to bring back potential face-to-face -face events or making different events to, to try and help build the community. Yeah. Uh, and uh, obviously for the people that didn't actually get the chance to join there, now they do have all the sessions on YouTube, right? Yeah, it was really quite interesting. You know, the, the number of people that don't have this uh, the ability to stay up for 24 hours straight and watch the event were like, when's this all going to be on YouTube? You know, yes. and and i was copying it from every single person like all these people on discord servers were going you know you should make it up straight away and i'm like well what's the point in staying awake for 24 hours if i just put it straight to youtube um and other people that i know have gone and emailed me going nathan you know you've you've really done the wrong thing by um you know loading them all up in one go you should have released them progressively <laughs> but <laughs> you know um i kind of gave up on the concept of you youtube algorithms with this one and, and basically all uh, 23 of the sessions, not 24, um, are uploaded. Um, there's one session that Rob Jackson did that he's looking to present a few more times in front of his clients, um, but that'll hopefully go up in July. Um, so there's there's more, there's probably the top tier of Archicad content, technical content available in the world that's the most current right now available on YouTube on my channel, which is, uh, you know, including your presentation, which is great because we're seeing a professional <laughs> render actually work and use Enscape rather than someone like myself who kind of uses it just as a, as a tool. Uh, I'd call myself an amateur uh, as just a, as an architect, just using it to get across the line. But 
you know, there's some great content there. Um, you know, the survey we've had done from the attendees, uh, 92% satisfaction rating. And, uh, you know, I've, I've run, I've I been was, involved in a lot of... <laughs> it, I, I don't, the thing is, is that it just demonstrates that the, the level of value that the community are placing on the types of topics and the caliber of presenters that we actually had that that gave their time up you know that's the thing the presenters put a lot of time and effort into their presentations and i think a lot of people forget the time it takes to put together a one hour presentation you know i've i've spent upwards of 40 hours sometimes putting one of those presentations together I, and i don't know what you i don't know for you but when it's new content and you're doing research and development to actually put a presentation together it's really hard um, but if it's content that you're rolling out and reusing over and over again, it becomes quite easy. <laughs> but you know, it's it's a lot of effort, and people need to people need to kind of praise the presenters for their efforts as well. And um, I, I was just actually reminded that both Enscape and Graphisoft were actually sponsors of the event. Hmm. How do you go on about uh, actually uh, not convincing them, but showing them that this is valuable for valuable for your community? And it would be actually a good idea to participate and actually help this event out. Yeah, it's, it's it's a hard one because what I have found is this year the sponsorship levels have dropped off considerably compared to the previous events. And to be honest with you, I have I, my my gut feeling is is it's because COVID's over and 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 people want to be talking face to face with potential customers again. Um, I've had a very long uh relationship with both graphics soft and enscape uh, so for me talking to them about how i can represent their brand and help bring value to their brand by participating in an event showcasing how good their software is there's not really like for graphics soft they have they produce some really good stuff um, i will be working with them in the coming 12 months to produce some stuff for them personally through their community but there's not much user-driven content out there uh, from an event standpoint uh, globally. So Graphisoft have backed this because it's helping their global their global audience. It's helping users for all over the world. And personally for Enscape, I think the challenge that they've faced for some time is that uh, I don't know how familiar you are with, with, the, with the volume of ArchiCAD users. 50% of ArchiCAD users are on Macs. So they're all sitting there dying to get their hands on Enscape, you know, for ArchiCAD and Mac, which, you know, from, from the conversations I've had with the team at, at Enscape, we're hopeful that we'll see that, you know, probably in the back end of the third quarter of this year, which would be a, a huge win for the ArchiCAD user community because then they get the benefits. Um, a lot of people on the Mac side have been twin motion people because of its availability and ability to be used on a Mac and to open the doors to another rendering platform, um, it's going to be a huge positive for the, for the user community. And, and essentially, what, what all at the end of the day, all it is is a tool, right? And people need to be able to have access to best in breed tool to enable their businesses to thrive. And then also like in this kind of uh, role, I think speed is very important because the people that have picked up in motion already have already gone in depth with it, are already used to it, and it's kind of going to be hard for those people to transition from uh, to motion and other kind of software to escape. But obviously, it's still uh, worth putting it out there. Maybe people do actually find those benefits and start using escape instead of uh, the other ones. But I was going to stop a little bit on ArchiCAD and uh, the tool uh, ecosystem because uh, maybe a lot of my viewers aren't very familiar with what BIM is because I yeah. that upload a lot of uh, videos that are used with SketchUp. So can you just give a brief explanation for those who are just starting out, maybe their architecture students, on what BIM is and how important it is to architecture industry? So BIM stands for Building Information Modeling, and there's a lot of other terminology that you'll see around what the acronym BIM means, and people will call it Better Information Management. They'll call things, you know, building information management. It's its all of these different things that it becomes. But when you come back down to it, it's, it stands for building information modeling. Now, what does this mean for industry and the profession? So when I started out as an architect uh, 20, well, I was a student 20 years ago when I first started in practice, 
we were doing work by hand in, and in 2D in AutoCAD. Now, what that meant was is that we'd have to draw all of our plans, then we'd have to project our elevations, and we'd have to you know, draw everything and manually check that everything was coordinated. Uh, now, what that meant was, uh, you know, the role that you've got now as a visualization artist, what you would see would be people that would be, they produce hand renders and hand sketches. Well, <laughs> there wasn't such thing as computer art. All of that. And then what we then did, I was, I was, you know, at Fulton Trotter, started there as a student 20 years ago. Then two years after I'd started, we then took on Archicad. Now, what that essentially is doing is, is that we're modeling uh, virtually a building uh, in three dimensions and then taking cut views from that. So what that means is, is we're essentially building a building before it gets built. And when you work collaboratively, uh, not just as the architect, but with all the full engineering team together, uh, working in separate models, what that enables you to do then is verify and kind of coordinate and check that the design actually will work before it gets built on site. Now, for students out there, the, the scariest thing that you'll you'll realize that when you become an architect is this thing called professional indemnity insurance. And, uh, you know, architects typically are people that are the most sued people in the construction industry. So we take on a lot of responsibility and risk. Uh, and clients also expect us to design buildings that do not um, have mistakes in them or have problems or our documents need to be kind of perfect, which no one's perfect. Uh, so by using software, so BIM is a process, which is a modeling process. Then you have BIM authoring software. So you have software like Archicad, you have Revit, you have Tecla. Um, there are other softwares for uh, engineering. So that I think they have Civil, Civil, I think it might have been called Civil CAD from Autodesk, but there's a Civil package from Autodesk. There's another package in Australia called 12D. All of these packages are software, but they're BIM authoring software. So we work collaboratively together to model things. To, it's kind of like virtual prototyping to make sure that our buildings work. Um, now, stepping into the side that you work and you specialize in with the visualization side, um, I really got a, a positive antidote with this. And, and this is one because for most of my career, I've worked in uh, not-for-profit. Most of the projects I've worked in have been in aged care, uh, education and community work and it's very been it, the things that you learn when you are engaging with various people is their ability to understand what a design is now as people within the construction industry most people have the ability to understand when they look at a set of drawings they know what that means and they know what the building will look like now, when you're sitting down with a client or a stakeholder, and, and many a times you'd sit down with a teacher or a nurse, they actually don't have the understanding or knowledge to be able to read a drawing. So, and, yeah. and what you've got to think of is that as architects, we're sitting at a table and explaining to our clients what we're going to build, what, what our design is going to look like. And, they, and then sadly, inherently, humans also fear being in a room and saying they don't understand things. So, so what happens is we sit in a meeting, you put your plans on the table, you assume that the client understands or the stakeholders understand what the design means. You, you point your pen at all of the parts of the drawing and they go, yep, yep, yep. But really, they don't know what you're talking about. Uh, then the building gets built. And then what happens is, is that they kind of get a shock and they say, well, I want to change this because it wasn't what I thought it would be. Now, you know, every single client meeting I walk into these days, most of them I'll take my VR headset and my model, my virtual model to take the client for a walk around the design that I've come up with them. And that is where BIM is so important in communicating. It's basically the main thing that I look about is communicating information to, to stakeholders. Now, it's communicating to clients. It's also communicating to engineers and builders. Um, you know, I use uh, like an app from 
graphics soft called BIM X, where we've given that to painters on certain jobs because of the multicolored panels that are on the mm. exo- at the facade of a building. So they yeah. know what to paint the panel. So 100%. I know that was a bit of a long winded answer about what BIM is, but I think it kind of yeah. gives you the holistic yeah. kind of start of it. And I we don't... haven't even delved into the benefits for asset owners <laughs> when, when it gets to their end yet. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, as you said, communication is crucial to them, but uh, as you mentioned, also, it kind of lowers uh, the chances of giving, like, errors or mistakes when the building is actually built. But what I actually want to stop and touch a little bit on is you mentioned Revit and ArcCAD. And yeah. I know that a lot of users maybe haven't gotten into any of those as of now, but they see the benefits of BIM. Now, what do you think are the benefits and like the pros and cons of each of those software since they're uh, the leading software uh, for uh, this area of uh, architecture software? And obviously, they're more popular in different type of regions of the world. So uh, can you just let people know which one is actually for them? And at least they can decide, but can you just let them know what are the pros and cons of uh, the software? Yeah, well, certainly. Well, I, I find that a really tough question to answer in many ways. But um, for me personally, I, I actually took on um, Archicad because when I was in university, in my second year university, university, my tutor told me that I need to stop hand drawing to communicate my design ideas. Uh, I needed to find a different methodology of presenting my designs. Otherwise, I'd fail the university. So at the time, I took on Archicad because... It was what uh, my friend, my mate was working for an office in Brisbane here, and that was the software they used. So we basically, I taught myself how to use ArchiCAD from scratch um, without any without any lectures and the like. But um, stepping forward into the role of a student and, and, and what they would like to do. Now, to be honest with you, Revan and ArchiCAD uh, are like apples and oranges, right? They're both fruits. Um, another idea or another analogy I sometimes think about is they're both, you know, one could be a blade screwdriver and one could be a Phillips head screwdriver. At the end of the day, they, they, they're a tool that we need to use as architects to, to do a task. And the task is produce information. Um, there's been so many debates on YouTube about which tool is better. Um, and the thing is, is if I was to sit here as a one-sided discussion point, you know, it'd be, well, this is better. Um, I don't think that's the case. My honest suggestion to students out there is research the local practices that you would like to work for. Uh, And on the back of what practice that you would like to work for or the practices that you'd like to work for, find out what software they're using in in their practice, right? And then learn that. And one of the things that I think that's really important to understand uh, as a student these days is that If you learn one of these tools, it isn't really that hard to learn the other as well. Uh, So, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges that you face or the arguments I face here around my local local region here in Australia around um, other architectural practice owners say that they, uh, you know, because Revit's a dominant software here in Brisbane, they say, well, you know, I want more students that know learn Archicad and when I was a director at another practice in Brisbane, um, my view was that I prefer people to not know ArchiCAD before they started with me because they, I could teach them the way I wanted them to learn rather than having to break bad habits. So for students that are listening and watching, my suggestion would be is try and learn the software that, that the practices that you want to join use, then that gives you the opportunity. Uh, take the time to learn it. Uh, both software packages are freely available for students. Uh, that they, That's the positive thing that both Autodesk and Revit have in place. But then at the same time, you know, sometimes visualization can be sometimes even easier using SketchUp um, if it's connected to a rendering package. And then you see these, you know, these open source software platforms like Blender and Blender BIM right now uh, kind of taking off um, because it's open source software. So there are lots of opportunities out there, but I, I still think the, the true answer to it really is, is think about where you want to get employment, 
uh, reach out and find out what tool they use and then and then you start learning that in university as you're studying so that you're preparing yourself uh to be able to be recruited because you can go and say well you know i've been using this tool for three years you know after i finish university and this is what i can do with it now right yes sir. Uh, i definitely agree with you in that point and that uh there's also i would suggest people to even if they're through visualizations uh artists and even if they use sketchup in the workflow i still believe that uh there's the part where i myself still implement ArpCAD and that's when I receive 2D floor plans, I think the quickest way to actually do, as I call the raw modeling, which only includes all doors, windows, um, for these slabs and all that, I just do it in ArpCAD and then from there on, you can actually export uh, from all BIM software, you can actually export it to SketchUp, at least there's for, that's for ArpCAD, I'm not sure for Revit, and then in SketchUp, you can obviously do more details if you want, but you can also do those details in ArpCAD, it just depends on how um, depends on how proficient you are in uh, all these BIM softwares. And I definitely agree with you, uh, with you on that one, but there's also some new technology that is coming up right now that a lot of people are excited, some are scared. Uh, and I just want to pick your brain on what you think about AI and how it will actually change the industry. Yeah, uh, well, the, the, my first kind of position on the AI front is that I think that they're misterming, missed, well, they're, they're using a wrong terminology at the moment. I really think we're not at that AI stage. I think we're still at the machine learning stage. I think that a lot of the tools that are creating these, you know, text responses, uh, image creation is all based upon scripts and code that people have written themselves to essentially create these regenerations. Um, and I think, I think at this point in time, it's kind of not, it's not in its infancy phase, but I think it's kind of in that, in that kind of, it's in that next step, but still kind of, it's not that bleeding edge, but it's kind of just that next step up. And like, there's some really cool, uh, tools that have been available for a couple of years now. Like. If you looked, I think, originally at some of the generative design stuff that came out of Autodesk at the time, and and there was some really interesting stuff that was happening in that space. Um, but then that was really, basically, the generative design kind of approach was kind of almost like a fad for 12 months or two years because then people realized that the time it took to actually analyze and assess the thousands of options that came up meant that you could have designed it from scratch anyway. Um, then you've got the kind of new computational design kind of approach to things. So, um, you know, 12 months ago, I think it was, I interviewed um, um, the founder of um, TestFit. And, and and I can't believe right now my, my mind is is, is uh, blank, blank with his name, but, but TestFit essentially is like a, a software that is assessing how to lay out warehouses, um, unit crazy. blocks, car parking. And I just Same. saw, and I just saw this week that TestFit are the first company to kind of partner with, uh, Autodesk's, um, former, I think it is, I think former, I'm not really on top of Autodesk that much with their, with their goings on, but, uh, that's, that's kind of one example. Um, I was really fortunate enough to meet a couple of startups. So there's a there's a, a young lady um, that I that I'm really good friends with, Alice Leong, and she works for Brick and Mortar Ventures, and they're venture capitalists for new new technology. And you know they're interested in uh, design and construction based um, concepts. And you know there's one uh, there's one of these uh, startups called Hoster AI. And just based on photographs, the the insurers can basically these photograph the, the software behind those photographs can actually identify the size of elements and the material that they're made of, so they can do insurance claims. So imagine going around and taking photographs around your house, and then that basically then can form this is what I want to ensure in part as part of my house. And then something happen, a claim happens and then they plug those photos into the system and they calculate what the actual claim value is. Now that's what the software is designed for. But I actually look at that technology and go, 
how can that technology be used to be used for um, as constructed? So on any job site, a site foreman walks around every single day and takes photos on his phone. Sorry, I said his phone, their phone. It's it's not just a male's role. Like sometimes Wrong. it's stuck in that terminology, <laughs> but the the four person the four person walks around every day and takes photos on their phone, Look. and that's part of their, their part of their job in terms of their logbook to to track work that's going on. Imagine those photos all got uploaded into a cloud, and then basically then assessed what was there in construction against what was designed in a design model to then essentially do a verification for design and construct. Uh, uh, there's some really good stuff in the in the laser scanning space. Um, really good software out of out of North America with Clear Edge 3D, which takes a point cloud and automatically models structures uh, yeah. and pipes. Now that and, type of stuff takes a yeah, lot of work. Well, another one of these, I think it was called Luma AI. You can basically, with your phone, you can just scan an object and then you will actually get the 3D file of the object, which is, it's insane. I mean, there's a lot of development happening on this side, but uh, I mean, there's probably a main question that is in all our heads. How do you think we will actually place ourselves in the marketplace with all of these new kind of software? Do you think that uh, the value of our services will be higher or will it drop and do you think a lot of people will be left without a job? You know what? I don't think I don't think the technology is going to take our jobs away. Um, there's a. I remember I was part of an event several years ago, and because I was involved in a lot of education architecture, uh, one of the presenters we had at this event was a futurist, and his name was Tony Ryan, and he was talking about how excited he is for the future for our children. And because, you know, everyone kind of sits there and they're a bit gloomy about what the challenges we're going to face moving into the future. And he was just like, we're going to have a great future. And I can see and I can understand where he's coming from. So imagine technology taking away some of the mundane tasks that we have to perform in any of our jobs. And what we then get to do is kind of have the people to people connection. So sitting down with our clients and, and talking about their ideas, you know, how good would AI be is if you sit down and had a client meeting, the, it transcribed the whole thing, which is the technology which does that already, but then it then sucked all of those kind of actions into the, into the BIM authoring software and then made all the changes for you automatically. It, it means that you're then actually able to do the human touch in terms of the communication and the, and the connection with the client. And it means that I think what a lot of people don't like paperwork, people study architecture thinking they're going to spend all day designing. Uh, it, <laughs> it's 5%. It's awful, awful. I, I can't stand it. Yeah. But, but what I do believe is, is that I think the fee structures will probably stay the same. I think that the time spent on projects might be more efficient or effective on things that we really want to be able to do rather than doing some of the things that we get bored doing, you know, like students when they start doing, uh, you know, all of the wet area layouts on a, on a big building or doing being in charge of doing the stair layouts. So I'm really optimistic for the future. The, the, challenge, the challenge that I think that the architectural profession faces, and I don't know really how bad this is globally, but here in Australia, uh, and it's possibly a global thing. Here in Australia, the industry is actually very slow to adapt and move. So the challenge may be those that, like my approach to this is always be learning, always be observing and seeing what comes across that will add value to your business. And don't discard it straight away. Okay, it's the, the answer I always put with some things are is, I've observed this technology today. It's not right for my business but I'm going to revisit it in 12 months time and keep my eye on it because you know like chat GPT unless you fuel it with enough information it doesn't spit anything of value out um, and, it, and it might not it, you know for some people some people are finding a huge benefit to it right now because 
uh, their ability to write isn't as great as others. And they're using it as a foundation stone to write fee proposals. I've even heard someone say they're using it to write fee proposals. So, fee proposals as well as like descriptions for projects, renders. I use it all day. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, you can feel free to continue. I was just going to touch on your, you actually uh, mentioned something that I really agree with you, uh, that architecture is an industry that adapts things uh, like latest in terms of all the other creative industries. I actually think is because the room for error is quite small. So for example, like let's say in painting, photography, you can just do a painting and then just, you, you can still throw it away if it doesn't uh, do the actual function that it is supposed to do, right? You can do the same thing with sculptures, uh, photography, graphic design, all of that. But um, actually experimenting in architecture is very scary because after you've built a whole building, a whole neighborhood, I believe it, what are you going to do with it if it's not useful? Just abandon it or actually just destroy it? And I think I think that's one of the reasons why architecture kind of uh, adapts things later on. Yeah, I can I can see that point with regards to uh, designing with new materials. That's where the risk is involved, I think. When it comes to process and experimenting with tools, the, the only challenge I think the profession faces, and I think this is where it, it, it harps back on your comment about risk, right? And it's essentially the number, the biggest thing I ever have in every project I deliver is the risk of someone getting injured on one of my projects. And that's really what architects face. Um, so if you take the view that you start to automate several of your processes, so you're trusting a machine to, to make decisions or implement the outcomes, it actually means you actually have to spend more time checking <laughs> and validating, um, which can sometimes be hard because you, you haven't factored that time into your project because you've gone, well, I've spent more time doing this, this automated this, you know, and one instance can be is, you know, where some, where one, where I can tell you right now, back. Back in 2013, we had a challenge on a project where the an attribute within Archicad switched itself because of because of files being linked to one another, and a material said it was something else that it wasn't, which resulted in the builder saying, "Well, no, this is what I believe it to be." So, it's where you have automation in place. That's where I can. It, it means that you actually have to be more vigilant. I think that's the word. <laughs> you have to be more diligent and, and, and you have to be more on top of everything that happens, uh, that cut the outputs. And in some ways, I think a lot of people don't like that role as an auditor because the auditing sometimes can take just as long as doing it yourself. So it's that it's that kind of uh, juggle, you know, in terms of finding the, the happy medium. And you know, really good examples these days with regards to structural engineering. So structural engineering, I'd hate to be a structural engineer because of the risk that they take in structures having to stand up. I but mean, they're, they're relying on... The map, but yeah. <laughs> oh, but, but, they're, but they're relying on, on software to do yeah. so, a structural analysis on things. And then they then still have, they then have to do the manual calculations to double check that it all works. So, you know, I... I have high hopes for the profession and the end of the future. I just think that as long as you within your organization keep on top of the trends and the changes that are occurring, I think that business will be fine. Uh, for those that the, for those that ignore it, there's going to be there's going to be little blips in the radar that might be a problem. So it's, but mind you, it's probably not it's not a doomsday thing, and you know I. I saw one of your previous podcasts where you were talking about the concepts of whether or not visualization or visualization artists are going to kind of not have a role in the future. I think there will be roles in the future, but they'll be slightly different. I don't think it might not every role that we have that we know as today will be different. But there's this other interesting comment I had because I'm involved with a bit of education as well, and what we're seeing today with the sub well, basically the kid. The children that are in school today, half of the jobs that they will be able to do when they graduate from school don't even exist today. So, 
So the challenge is, is that we've got an education system that has to educate people, but then it's educating people. It has to educate you as kind of a generalist and probably, you know, and all of these different kind of uh, methodologies of, you know, uh, team, team, team delivery and project learning and all that sort of stuff so that you can then adapt to the new roles and, and jobs that might appear once they graduate. But, you know, nothing like a bit of diversion in the conversation. <laughs> I actually want to touch on this a little bit because uh, I do have a lot of like colleagues in university and all that, and a lot of people, not only in the architecture field, there's a lot of field of people are actually uh, not very aligned to college and not very aligned on what is actually being taught in college, university, and all this. Yeah. At least where I live in Kosovo, it's required to actually have a degree to be able to do projects that are accepted in municipality and all of that, which actually means you cannot be an architect without having an architecture degree. What are your thoughts on this? Is architecture school in general actually a good preparation phase for people that do want to get into the industry? And is it enough to get started straight away after that? You know what, I think your questions, that it's a perfect question for education conversation. Uh, there was a really good post in LinkedIn about two or three weeks ago from one of my former business partners, uh, Ryan Loveday, with regards to the issues with uh, the education system in university and not preparing students well enough for when they get released into the industry. Um, there's lots of challenges in that front. Uh, first of all, here in Australia, we have a couple of tiers of people that can produce drawings that can be submitted uh, we have uh, two different tiers, I guess you could say. We have building designers, and they can design buildings up to certain sizes. Uh, and then we have architects. And sadly, architectural registration isn't a uh, whole of the country. Uh, registration system in Australia is actually state by state. So if I wanted to be registered, I cannot, legally I can only call myself an architect in Queensland. Uh, if I go to another state, I'm legally not able to call myself an architect because I'm right. not registered in that state. If you get Although, in all of the states to actually be able to design buildings in every part of Australia. Yes, yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah. And, and, and there's some benefit to that in terms of having separate licensing. Um, it, from my mind, there is a lot of negatives in the sense that it is kind of, I see it as kind of a money grab in terms of paying your fees for every state. But the interesting thing is, is that the size of Australia, you look at the size of Australia, it's almost the size of North America. Um, or if you place Australia over Europe, it is almost the size of mo a big block of it. So you think of um, Europe and the number of different countries that that in, in cases, how hard it would be to actually kind of be on top of all of the different types of rules that are relevant in each one of those countries. So sadly here in australia all of our states have different ways of lodging uh, documentation for projects so being registered in separate states means that you need to be on top of those things um, with regards to students being ready uh, once they graduate no chance no chance in the world um, university i think at this point in time performs one part of the role and it doesn't perform all of it in terms of preparation for being able to practice. And the methodology that they used to have here in Australia that worked really, really well, uh, when I went through university, uh, near on 18 years ago now, I finished. Um, you worked uh, four days a week in architectural practice, and then you went to university for one full day and one night a week. So what that meant was, is that you were learning in practice as you were studying that's much so, better than i honestly <laughs> well, that, well, works. That, yeah. that methodology is lost now because uh, i don't know why it changed uh it's disappointing that it's changed because it means that students are less prepared so basically when by the time they finish university they've done no days in a they might have done no days in an architectural practice so when they graduate um they have to hit the they hit um, the industry there is uh, minimum pays that they have to be paid under the award wage and from a practice owner's perspective you know it's it's a fairly reasonable amount of money 
by the time you add computer, o- you know, office space, uh, all the software packages, the, the, all that, yeah, and the training. Yeah. So it becomes a huge investment in a student um, once they graduate. But when they're a student, the the price, the payment, or the, the minimum salary is a little bit less. So it means that there's the ability to train them up as a student when they're going through, which helps them get more and more, more and more knowledge, right? And in all honesty, I've basically one in Australia the methodology is is that you graduate from university, then you have to do I think nineteen hundred hours in a logbook before you can set your registration exams. And pass your registration exams, then you can become an architect. Now. That 1900 hours can be done probably within 18 months of graduation. So 18 months to two years of graduation. There's not a lot of people I know that could actually take the full responsibility. And and this is the interesting thing, right? So in Australia as a registered architect, if I was a registered architect in, in New South Wales, I personally, as an architect, if I had the experience, because the Architects Act here is to protect the consumer, um, if I had the knowledge and experience, I could actually produce the drawings and sign off as the architect for something like the Sydney Opera House. <laughs> so as an architect, we're not limited by scale or size. We can basically do, the, the Architect Act talks about only doing projects that you would be capable of doing. And I think that's the, the thing that saves, I guess, newly registered architects from going and doing silly things like... Uh, going the thing is it's that they're at your own discretion though too so it doesn't mean that you have to be registered for a certain number of years before you can take on a major project it just comes down to you as an architect knowing that what you're capable of and not taking on something that's you know bigger than you should be taking on but the there's two sides to it so there's obviously architecture teaches you the design side and that kind of critical thinking industry is teaching on the side of technology tools how buildings go together because unfortunately university you don't get that hands-on experience on job sites to see how buildings go together which enables you to detail things uh and you know there was there's a really great initiative in europe uh a few years ago and and i I think they ran their last event again they did they did they were able to run it again last year called built academy and it's a program or a summit at this point in time that's been set up for university students where technology leaders from across Europe at this stage, because it's run in in Europe, uh, would do a whole day of mentoring these university students and how to use certain technology. Now, I was supposed to run that event here in Australia last year, but we pulled the pin on it. But the goal will be is to try and set something up in the future along those lines to here in Australia to essentially assist undergraduates or university students to get a leg up and understand technology and process and, and how they can use all these different tools before they start within the industry. So that's kind of another thing on my plate as an idea to try and solve. I did have this debate with a lot of people and uh, most of them actually agree that the educational system in universities and college is not enough for architects which is unfortunate because there's still a lot of work that has to go through even after completing that and after paying the lump sum of money and um, doing a lot of time there. But let's talk a little bit about your own architecture practice and how has that journey been going and how hard is actually um, to be independent as an architect in the sense of uh, the entrepreneurship kind of things? Yeah, well... For me, it's been an interesting journey. So I started off my architectural career uh, as a student at a practice called Fulton Trotter Architects. And they have they have an office in Brisbane and Sydney and, it, and they're about 55 staff. And I progressed my way through that office from student to graduate to architect to associate to associate director and then, and then was invited to become an owner within that practice. And... So I spent two years as an owner at Fulton Trotter Architects between 2017 and 2019, which closed out essentially uh, 16 and a half years with that one practice. Uh, The practice was in a bit of a tough 
point in time in 2019 and I kind of felt that I needed to move on um, from there. Um, it was it was a disappointing time, but I thought to myself that I'd probably be better off working with my working by myself rather than um, in the in the team. And and it was hard because I'd originally envisaged myself being there for the rest of my career, and I walked away from clients that I've worked with for over a decade, and that was really hard because there was some amazing work that I got to deliver when I was there and some really great clients and also walked away from my team, which was really, really hard to do because my team were delivering really good work. We were working really well. We were delivering profitable work um, as well. So we had happy clients and profitable work and what more do you want in an architectural practice? Now, so back in 2019, I then kind of, Spent probably 12 months, I think, <laughs> probably uh, having a bit of uh, post um, post uh, stress, I guess you call it PTSD, <laughs> post trauma stress disorder, in terms of having moved on and and realised that that wasn't going to be my future. It was a, it was a challenging uh, 12 months, but my practice now is a really good mixture of work. So I practice architecture. I also uh, advise practices in Archicad and BIM implementation, and also do some digital advisory work for asset owners, including government agencies. And for me, it is a very diluted um, bucket of work, but it's drawing upon all the expertise that I've built up over the last 20 years. and. The really nice thing about it is, is that there's not many people out there that have been an owner of a major practice that can is in that advisory space for people in the implementation. It's always just technical people there to provide that advice. And because I run my own architecture arm as well, it means that I can then say to people, I'm doing this on my own architectural work. Therefore, it's kind of that whole thing of I'm doing it, so it's good enough for you as well. So it's not just saying, here, you should do this because it's good for you. Um, at the moment, all three of them, all three of those kind of silos, and they're not really sil they're silos in terms of work streams, but they all inform one another. And the sad thing that I have is that, you know, my my website looks like all I ever do is BIM and events, um, but it's really difficult when you're starting back out again because all that portfolio of 20 or 17 years worth of work that I did at Fulton Trotter, I, don't, I can't really put it up on my website, right? doesn't work that way so it's building up from scratch again so hopefully over the next couple of months you know I've, I've got a, I've got some some beautiful projects that have been finished and and it means I'll be able to go out get them photographed and actually then create the architecture section of my website and I've been I've, I've done some fun stuff from you know I've designed a baseball stadium I've designed a, a jewelry store I've designed shop fit outs. I've designed, you know, multi-million dollar homes on canals. I've done some really cool renovations for, for all of, you know, for these houses that, you know, are pretty challenging to, to live in from the 1980s. So it's, it's exciting, mate. The, the positive is, is that, um, is that I no longer have, um, anyone else to kind of, uh, hassle me or deal with it it means that i get to be my own thing but the challenges also are then that when you're not in partnership with anyone else there's no one to help you when you have a, a, a lull in in workload so it has its positives and its negatives you know um and also the other challenge being is that when you're a small company um people don't like taking chances on you whereas if you're a larger organization you got more opportunities presented to you because they go well there's you know i'm not relying on one person um despite the capabilities i have to be able to deliver you know insane amounts of work very very it's quickly trust thing i believe yeah it's all uh, it's all a trust thing but a lot of people contribute uh the success in terms of getting clients and doing a lot of work to their networking skills so how do you think uh, that stands in terms of as a marketing strategy and what do you think are the other ways people are being able to get connections and start designing more projects through social media events and all of that? Yeah, it's 
the, the, the interesting thing is there was a recent uh, report done by the Australian Institute of Arctics talking about where most Arctics get their work from. And most of it is through referrals. So the key thing I personally believe is to make sure that you um, are out there talking to people and telling them what you're capable of doing. And the challenge you have with, with that is, and, and this is where the one challenge I have right now is, is that um, publicly my image in all the social media channels doesn't look like I do a lot of architecture. So the the thing that I think that's really important with the regards to networking is, is have a strong strategy around what type of projects you want to work with. Uh, and once you have that strategy, get into social media. There's some really like, oh, there's some really incredible stuff that people are doing on uh, Instagram right now, because a lot of people just sit all day on their phones looking at Instagram and, and I find that there's a lot of people doing kind of, you know, almost like YouTube short type videos on, on Instagram where they're talking about certain key things that are important to certain clients. Like, for example, you know, with the sport and recreation side of my business, I know that having a master plan in place is like the most critical thing for them to have because they have volunteer committees that kind of come and go. So they need a kind of master plan to drive their, their agenda. So communicating what things are important to a certain client type and understanding where that what that means being involved with associations that are relevant to your client base and the type of clients you want as well um, and putting out content that's relevant to it and once again you know it's kind of funny talking to me about this when i've got nothing on my website really that reflects architecture it's kind of a dead end space at the moment but they're the things that I've been kind of waiting on having some more projects finished because the other challenge you face as a new practice is you're relying then on your visualization of unfinished work to sell your business. And all clients really want to see uh, is imagery of, of finished projects so they can go, you know, what? they want to see what you can deliver. They want to see what's built rather than the, the scary thing is, is that there's a lot of benefits in showing the ideas and showing, you know, things that look nice. And sometimes I find a little bit of, of some of the problems with the architecture stuff is, is that the imagery is up there kind of to boost the ego of architects rather than actually sell to the clients. And people need to really remember what their clients are looking for rather than trying to, what they think they need. And I think that's yep. the key thing. 100% and a lot of architects create to actually um, get a pat on the back from other architects which is so crazy because I see this all the time architects really care what their peers think uh, more so what their clients think and I think it's uh, insane that we all like I say we but I mean architectures in the field always see validation from all their other architects and not from uh, their own clients where I'm trying to adopt this mindset where um, I do care more about the client than uh, what anyone else thinks about my work. And uh, that's kind of the yeah. best way, I believe, to go in and grow your business. So, no, uh, it, yeah. is. it has to be. It has to be because at the end of the day, the other architects are your competition. They're not actually your client, right? And other architects liking a work isn't going to win you more work. Uh, it's, it's, it's clients being in love with what you design, you know, like... I walked into a meeting, I think three months ago with a client and they, the first comment was, was, oh, that wasn't what I was expecting. So how good is that when you walk in? And <laughs> the thing is, is the challenge with that comment is it could be either a good thing or a bad thing, right? And it's, and when you know you get it right, and then they kind of, the, 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 the ultimate feedback is when it goes through another feedback loop where you hear back through your network that this person that you've met with and showed them the design for their, their renovation of their home, for example, they're basically saying, I've spoken to such and such and they basically are absolutely wrapped with what you've done. Like that's the ultimate type of feedback you want to be achieving. It doesn't matter one little bit at all, whether or not uh, the post on Instagram that you did gets liked by architects. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> the thing is that we shouldn't be in business to try and like, I know there's a prestige to, you know, winning architecture awards and, and then that's kind of an, almost like an ultimate kind of thing, but I'd rather win an architecture award off the back of a client being that satisfied 
that they kind of praise you and 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 speak to every single one of their friends that that you're the you were the best thing that ever yes, happened to them. Definitely, that's definitely. Really, that's the ultimate praise, right? I mean, the uh, architecture awards are just for actually gaining respects from other architects. I mean, you can ask anyone uh, when you're walking down the road and ask who was like the Pritzker Award or whatever. They they don't actually care. I mean, I'm not um, down playing on the importance right. of that aspect. Like, I mean, that that's a whole another level, and I'm not here to sit and and judge uh, on that regards but i myself i am a lot more uh business minded in the sense but not actually a business mind in the sense of scamming but in the sense that i'm trying to do what is going to satisfy the clients the most and obviously the actual benefits of that is that they're going to be so happy of it they're going to be proud of their new home their new property and they're going to show other people they're going to have guests come over to their house and that's kind of how it all works on referrals, at least from my opinion on what you mentioned earlier. But I also think that the fact that most of the work is coming from referrals leaves also a major gap in social media to actually take advantage of and create new uh, strategies because I do see a lot of people are actually uh, minimizing their opportunities on that aspect. So, uh, yeah. No, there's, there's, there's heaps of opportunities there, but you know, touching back on the architecture awards program, what that does though, is, you know, you talked before about, we talked before about risk and change and it's the architecture awards program that drives innovation in design. So that has, it has a very strong value in that sense. Uh, and, you know, like I can tell you every single residential client I've worked with, they live on Pinterest. So whenever it comes down to wanting to show off pieces of your work, um, I, I haven't I haven't really delved into Pinterest that much. But every time I meet with someone, they've gone, oh, I've got a Pinterest board set up for the for my house. And most of the time what you'll find is is that it's like 30 different competing design <laughs> themes. Yeah. And yeah. what you've got to do is try and it's kind of the, the role of the architect is to interpret a brief, right? So the whole idea is, is you take those 30 kind of images of all different styles and, and then go, okay, what is it that they're really after? You know, what is it that's going to change their life? And, 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 and the challenges that we face as architects are many with that, but, um, <laughs> the, the key thing is, is that you can't, you can't, um, hide behind your desk when it becomes when it comes to any kind of business and, and moving it forward you have to get out there and be where your clients are 100 percent. yeah i definitely agree on that and on that note i really want to thank you for actually being in the podcast i do believe that a lot of people have gotten a lot of value from this uh conversation and um yeah i mean uh, feel free to say any uh like advice to young architects as a final kind of uh discussion to this podcast Oh, nice closing line. But no, thanks very much for having me, Melosh. It's been great to, to talk to you today and 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 share with you some of the kind of my thoughts, I guess, on the profession and the challenges and the and the and the positive things moving forward. But the the number one thing I think that I kind of say to people when I talk to them uh, as students or, or anyone really, and and I guess it kind of comes from the craziness that I have because. Uh, you know who who would run a 24-hour conference by themselves right uh but but the thing is is that there's this one thing in sport where we talk about the one percenters and and one of the things i do learn a lot from is high performance uh coaching from with 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 sport and they're, they're the things that i think about a lot and the key to being successful in sport is very much similar to the key to success in business and life is always focusing on that extra 1% of effort. So think about investing in yourself, not crazily, but invest a little bit more in yourself uh, and what you do to make what you, who you are and what you ca are capable of uh, a differentiator from you and your peers. And that will help you in terms of finding a job. And that'll hopefully help you if you're out in practice trying to compete to win other work against uh, other architects so that'd be my one piece of advice and on that note i want to thank everyone for watching the podcast and i'll see you on the next one